All right, everyone, we're about to get started with our panel, Alabama versus the Great Reset. Uh, my name is Will Blakely. I'm a reporter with 1819 News. Um, so I guess to cut, to cut right to the chase, I mean, the, the panel today is about uh, the Great Reset. And so the Great Reset is a term used by the World Economic Forum and other global policymakers. Um, but as Alan said earlier, some do dismiss it as a, just a conspiracy theory. Um, and so, could y'all explain to us what you believe uh, the Great Reset Agenda is and whether or not it is a real threat to Alabama today? Uh, yeah, so um, the Great Reset is a um, globalist plan uh, engineered by uh, NGOs, in particular the World Economic Forum, in conjunction with the UN. They, had, uh, they signed a contract in um, 2019 uh, to accelerate the, the, the attainment of the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So the Great Reset could be understood as a public-private partnership arrangement to accelerate the, the, um, de the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. And what are those? Those are um, a bunch of, uh, well, it's written in nothing but doublespeak and, um, you know, uh, propaganda. But it's really about um, mitigating so-called climate change, uh, supposedly uh, eradicating poverty in the world, which really just means government uh, transfers of wealth from the developed world to the developing world to keep them from developing. Um, and um, it is, um, you know, there's all these other goals like gender equality. Uh, gender equality really has to do with making sure women only work uh, in the professional lives and, have, and do not raise, uh, have children. Um, the sustainability, one of the things about sustainability, this buzzword that they use, it is there is a population control agenda involved with sustainability. It is not strictly about keeping the environment sustainable. They believe that <clears throat> there's too much consumption in the developed world and we need to keep these people from reproducing and uh, eating meat and uh, guzzling gas. So there's a real st strict uh, thing there. What it means to Alabama is, um, we'll let others talk about that, but it'll, it'll affect everybody. So. One th way to understand the Great Reset is it is the opposite of decentralization. So whereas we want decentralization, get the federal government off our backs, get to the local level as much as possible, they want to agglomerate the state into a central world global state. And so it is the exact opposite impetus that drives people like us, liberty-minded people. <clears throat> so I'm Brian Dawson, I'm the CEO of 1819 News. Uh, I, if you've ever been in a room, and especially on a panel where you think everyone in the room is smarter than you, I've reached that point in my life right this moment. <laughs> uh, I'm not a think tank guy, so they brought this redneck up here to balance things out a little bit, so. <laughs> um, so I think the the the, conspiracy theorist aspect is the thing, and, it, and it's starting to lose its uh, appeal, like calling someone racist or xenophobic or homophobic. That used to like, you know, be quite the punch to someone, but now they've thrown it around so much that it's, it's basically gone, and, and I think that's happening with conspiracy theorists. One of the few positives that came out of COVID was that, is that it, you know, it used to be about six months for a conspiracy theory to come true. Now we're at about three, you know, 90 days-ish. <laughs> Um, so I think that's interesting, but I think to me, the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, all of these things, it springs from uh, Karl Marx and the long march to the institutions and the ultimate fulfillment of what I believe, I'm a Christian and I believe Karl Marx was demon possessed and he wrote, you know, uh, wrote his manifesto and uh, died and went to a funeral and there was like three people there, no one even knew who he was. Uh, and those writings were picked up by Lenin and uh, Stalin and pushed into uh, Bolshevik Revolution, uh, which is anti-West, anti-everything that Christendom or, or the West is about. 
And so I think this is the fulfillment of it. Um, they hate everything we stand for, um, and this is, this is what they're trying. Um, I, I think it's peak long march through the institutions. I think how it's gonna affect Alabama. Um, so, man, I don't wanna give a whole political history of Alabama, that would take forever. The short version is business runs the state here, and I don't, I'm not talking about mom and pop business, I'm talking Alabama Power, Regions, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, you know, those people, that's who runs this state, okay? And what's interesting is that's always been a very Republican thing. Big business, Republican, okay. Well, now the head of the Business Council of Alabama, which is our state chamber of commerce, is a lady named Helena Duncan, and she's essentially um, a Marxist, right? And so what you're starting to see is Alabama Power and these other big corporations that have always ran the state are bowing the knee to ESG. They're bowing the knee uh, to all of these socialist policies and everything else, and um, that's gonna take big business left, and it will be interesting to see whether that's gonna take the people of Alabama with it, and I don't think it will. Um, the, the problem that we've always had in our state is that we have the most conservative people in the world, in the United States, that live right here in Alabama, but we don't have legislation and government that reflects it, right? And so um, that's a, a big goal of 1819 News is to be able to inform the people of Alabama about what's going on so that they can get involved in government and get a legislation and governor and things that actually reflect them. So, but, but I think that's where it's gonna affect Alabama the most is gonna be these big, we call them the big mules. The big mules um, are buying into ESG and that's who runs our politics and runs our state. And all the guys that run around every four years to get elected talking about how much they love Jesus guns and free markets, well, the people that are paying, you know, putting money in their campaigns are gonna be pushing them to move left with ESG and everything else. So um, there's gonna be a fight. And I, I think Alabama's ready for a fight. So there you go. I've got a mic, is it on? Yep. Uh, well, ESG is going to affect, of course, Alabama and every state. There's a reason uh, why uh, the Who Cares Wins conference with the United Nations, again, government of Switzerland at all, targeted financial institutions and capital markets is the place to start because that's where all capital flows are. You look at the industries that make money with money and you realize that if we can control all capital flow, then we can control everything beneath that framework. Um, so that's why uh, people like executives at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, et cetera, uh, big accounting firms, big investment firms, were all invited to, to Who Cares Wins, and that's why they are uh, invited to the World Economic Forum as well. Um, Alabama has made some efforts to push back, nothing like you know, DeSantis in Florida or uh, Texas and West Virginia are doing a lot to push back, but we did sign on to... Uh, uh, an, e, an anti-ESG alliance, 18 states signed onto that. Our Attorney General Steve Marshall has joined a lawsuit against the Department of Labor, which was considering, uh, a, 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 well, actually it instituted a rule to allow for uh, for ESG 401k investments. Um, but it, will it have, ESG affect Alabama? Of course, it affects everybody um, and everybody that has investments. I mean, I think the, the best thing we can do is, you know, raise alarm bells, ring the alarm bells, because if ESG-weighted portfolios continue to underperform on the market, I think money still talks. I think when people start seeing that they're, uh, they're not getting returns on investment because their mutual fund manager or BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, their asset manager, if they, if they have money with those entities, or if it's the state pensioners who are um, having their state pension funds invested in uh, ESG-weighted portfolios that are not doing as well as other portfolios, then you're going, you know, you're going to see some outcry. But people have to pay attention and have to watch uh, the performance of those things because the only way ESG works is if you get full systematic buy-in. Because, I mean, investment is tradi traditionally predicated on this notion of diversification, right? You want your funds spread out across as much uh, as many different industries as possible, as many different fields as possible uh, to mitigate risk, right? If one field starts uh, doing badly, then another one's gonna prop you up and all that. Well, ESG, by definition, it, it already narrows the range of possible um, fields in which you can invest. It's gotta be in only these particular industries and these particular uh, companies. And that is the opposite of diversification. And you'll hear people talk about, the, the ESG proponents talk about uh, risk management as if you know, the, the risk is gonna be climate change, but it's long-term risk. They always emphasize that it's long-term risk. Well, that means that 
after two years, after three years, after four years, when these climate catastrophes haven't happened, they can just keep saying, well, it's long-term. It just hasn't happened yet. You know, the, the risk is long-term. And, uh, and also they warn against regulatory risk while paying all these lobbyists to champion these regulations. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're like, oh, you know, you're going to get all these regulations. For example, the SEC rule that I talked about um, earlier, you're going to get all these regulations and they're going to be a risk to you as an investor long-term. Well, then they're actually paying lobbyists to try to get these regulations passed. So um, it's very deceptive. Uh, and, and of course it affects Alabama. It affects every state and it affects every human being that banks. Yeah, and so you... You listen to a lot of what's said from the World Economic Forum and what comes out of ESG, and a word that I think most of us uh, would use to describe a lot of these things is woke. Uh, now, of course, um, recently a slew of uh, left-wing pundits have accused people on the right of um, not being able to define the word woke. Um, I don't think they uh, have read any of Michael's books. Um, so. Michael, if you could um, define the word woke for us and just explain what it has to do with the Great Reset uh, and maybe how it's found its way into Alabama. Oh, I'm sure it's found its way into Alabama. I'm sure everybody could attest to that. Um, well, you know, this word woke has a fairly long history. Of course, it was first a past tense verb, right? It means having woken up or having awakened but it, it started to be used as an adjective in the 1970s by uh, the African-American community, and it just meant like aware of uh, what's happening. And then it transmuted into uh, uh, conscious, uh, conscious of uh, racial in, in injustice. Uh, and then uh, it, it was taken up and uh, finally got its way into being effect effectively uh, associated with social justice. And, it became a kind of equivalent of social justice. And um, so it's supposed to be redressing all of these um, inequities uh, between various peoples, uh, various constituencies, and it's supposedly to benefit these beleaguered groups. But um, really what it is, and its function with reference to the Great Reset is this. It is about guilt tripping the population into believing that everything they have is a function of their privilege, which therefore should be revoked so that they will not have any rights or property. Um, and so it makes, makes them feel uh, fine with this idea that it's supposed to make you feel that you should accept these reduced expectations that come with the Great Reset, this reduced consumption, uh, this reduced uh, mobility, economic and physical mobility. Uh, basically, it is to the function of wokeness is to make the uh, it's to attack the, the majority and their way of life, and uh, they use guilt and uh, they figure everything in terms of privilege, which can be revoked. Rights and privileges are different. Rights supposedly inhere in the individual, but privileges are something that are extended to you. And likewise, if we take them away, then you haven't really lost anything you deserved. And that's really the function of wokeness. So if you go read any company's ESG report uh, when they put it out, one thing that you'll quickly notice is under S, um, you, you see a lot of references to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. Um, and so, Alan, since you're the higher ed guy, um, could you explain exactly what DEI is um, and whether or not it purports to do what its objectives are? Oh, I'd be thrilled to do that. Um, well, nominally, the D stands for diversity, but it actually means uniformity of thought, so it's the opposite. Uh, the E nominally means equity, but it's all about treating people unequally based upon immutable characteristics such as their race. For example, if you are white, then you are treated uh, with discrimination. You are alleged to have privilege that you uh, must basically leave at the door, and um, it means all sorts of uh, affirmative action type programs. Um, you get uh, different forms of um, like training in the workplace, 
that, uh, that teaches you that uh, if you are born one way with the skin color one way, that you are responsible for a whole range of injustices and past historical uh, discrimination that happened long before you were born, and that therefore your role is to let other people have positions and power um, regardless of their merit, whether they've earned it, whether they have the requisite wherewithal, skills, talent, or knowledge, they are entitled to that position. And this is a form of quote unquote equity, which is all about equal outcomes rather than pure equality. Um, and then uh, inclusion is all about exclusion. In fact, it's inclusion means you have to believe what we believe to be part of this belongingness. If you do not believe what we believe, then you are automatically excluded. So it means exactly the exact opposite. Each term sounds good in theory, um, but in, in, in practice and in the way it's done is uh, very dangerous and, uh, and, and in fact leads to all kinds of uh, systemic uh, problems that become instituted in law. Again, I like to use the phrase encoding elite preferences. When the elites encode their preferences in law, administrative agencies, universities, bureaucracies, so that they're so much more difficult to dislodge. Once they're embedded, it's hard to get them out. So when you talk about uh, you know, systemic racism or something like that, you've got systemic anti-racism, which is you know systemic um, uh, measures that are put into law, institutions, administrative agencies with uh, the express purpose of discriminating against people based on actually their skin color. The thing that we uh, used to decry, you know, people, you know, the whole Martin Luther King uh, line about you know judging people by the uh, the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. That's long gone for the left now. They want to judge you based upon the color of your skin, regardless of how uh, regardless of what you think. You're automatically disqualified from having a legitimate opinion if you look a certain way. Um, yeah, having been. Um canceled by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Group at NYU. By the way, the Mises Institute mistakenly put at New York University on my name tag. That's why I will not wear it. Uh, uh, I was uh, one of the first professorial victims of the, diverse, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Movement, which I like to say, uh, rather than D-E-I, I call it D-I-E, D-I-E. Uh, they, they canceled me for, they said, the content and structure of my thoughts. So this was a wrong think con conviction uh, in an Orwellian courtroom um, in, in which I had no witnesses and wasn't able to testify for myself. So yeah, this is what die comes down to. It's, it's an execution squad. Um, and uh, the... Um, the, the conformity, I, I, think, I think I was the first to coin this. <laughs> it's the conformity, inequity, and exclusion uh, group. That's what I call that group that uh, came after me. Anyway. So this is a question for all of y'all. Um, you know, Alabama is a Republican supermajority. Um, we're, uh, we're a conservative state. Um, but how equipped are we to... Um, I guess resist the Great Reset, and what exactly can we do on a state level? I think the Republican supermajority thing, and it was, it was really interesting. I just read an article the other day. I think it was by the Daily Wire. It actually says the, 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 the thicker your Republican majority is, the more moderate your legislature is, which is really weird. But I'd never seen that on a broad scale. I thought maybe it was just something that Alabama uh, suffered from. Um, but uh, in particularly, how are we going to push back against uh, the Great Reset? I think um, information, knowledge, and uh, resistance is, from the people is what it boils down to. Let's use COVID as the example. So here we are, um, you know, Kay Ivey came out uh, during all those things uh, as, as state after state was shutting down, blue state after blue state, and she literally came out and said, we're not California, we're not gonna lock down. And three days later, she locked us down and gave us a, uh, uh, what do they call that, where you can't go out after seven, a curfew. And, and 
The thought that we had a curfew in Alabama is just mind boggling. But what do you do with the curfew? Don't go out after seven. Well, I'll see you guys after seven. We'll go somewhere and meet, right? And so that is, I think, what it boils down to, uh, to me, because um, whether we, as long as Alabama is dependent on federal funds and federal funds flowing to the state, um, you know, for our economic well-being, we're never going to be able to be who we actually are. And so the hope would be to elect people who begin to wean us off of federal dollars. So a political solution would be looking for candidates that can actually win, uh, who are running on um, getting off the federal teat, right? And so I think that's a big piece of it. But to me, I think just um, the, the ability for people to resist. And so um, Alabama was the least vaccinated state, okay? You should give yourselves a round of applause for that. Every media outlet in the country, in the nation, mainstream media was slandering and pounding the state of Alabama for our vaccine hesitancy, right? This disease we have called vaccine hesitancy. And so we were being berated, insulted, called no good dirty rednecks and all this other stuff. And, and we just stood, even Donald Trump came here and told us to get vaccinated and we booed him, right? And so, The reason I love Alabama is the people, um, and, and we have what it takes to resist. Put your mask on, no. Get vaccinated, not gonna do it. You know, your kid has to wear a mask in school, no he doesn't, right? That's really it, like, no, just say no. And, and, and I think that's where it begins with us, but as a, as a political standpoint, it's, it's that dependence upon uh, federal dollars flowing to the state, and it's gonna be hard to break. Yeah, I will say there's a resistance movement that wasn't there before. I mean, you've got an underdog media outlet in 1819 News, which is not docile, submissive, or complicit in, uh, in, in all these things and doing great, great work. Um, you've got actually Matt, Matt Clark, who's sitting right here, is an attorney who founded the uh, Alabama Center for Law and Liberty. There was no litigation mechanism for challenging a lot of sort of uh, status and unconstitutional um, practices and conditions, and uh, ACLL is, is now one of them. Matt recently filed an open records request with the uh, RSA asking basically specifically whether uh, the, the state was using BlackRock, but needs to do, more, I think we need a lot more of that. Um, we need to look at all the asset management firms. We need to look at what proxy advisory services um, we are, we're employing in the state. Um, I actually, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that by speaking out and launching an anti-book business program, I just happened to get in touch with people all over the country who uh, were surprised that such a thing could actually happen on a university campus. And um, there's one guy that, that communicates with me quite regularly, and he's in Pennsylvania. And he just, I think he just sits and watches YouTube videos all day. And um, <laughs> he, he sent me a video uh, last week that has the CEO of ISS, it's his, first of all, the recording, it, this YouTube video had 26 views. And in the video, the CEO of ISS is telling his interlocutor that, oh yes, we are doing investment stuff that, that actually will hurt state pensioners, it will underperform, but in the long run, it's sort of necessary to get easier. And I'm like, this is it, this is like a smoking gun for a lawsuit, 26 views. So, um, you know, I think there are opportunities to litigate some of these things, and uh, we need to start start doing that. Yeah, I have. I, I'll, I'm not going to preempt my own talk, but I, I have a nine-point plan for stopping the Great Reset. 